Hey, Professor Davis here. We are going to start looking at the second part of the endocrine system diseases and disorders. And we are going to start where we left off with the pancreas. So guys, we're going to be looking at the pancreatic islet or Langerhans diseases. And this is going to be where we have to remember that the pancreas has a dual role. We talked a little bit about the pancreas and the digestive system and there being some disorders with that. And that's when it's what we would call an exocrine gland. It's excreting different digestive enzymes in order to help, um, of course, digest proteins, fats, sugars, that sort of thing in your intestines. But your pancreas has another purpose as well. There are some specialized cells in these isolates that produce hormones that are part of the endocrine system. And these are going to be things like insulin and glucagon. These islets of Langerhans secrete insulin when your blood sugar is too high. When your sugar gets get high, this pancreas the area in the pancreas should release insulin, causing your cells to take in the glucose, lowering your blood sugar. On the other hand, the antagonistic type of hormone that it releases is glucagon. Glucagon is going to be when your blood glucose levels are low, it's going to get released by the pancreas and glucagon is going to tell your cells and stuff to release its kind of reserves or stores of uh, gl glucose raising your blood glucose levels. So they are opposites, okay, when we look at this. Now, the reason why blood sugar is such a big deal or glucose is such a big deal is your cells prefer to use glucose in order to make ATP. In order to in order to take the energy from glucose into a form your cells can use by converting it into ATP. Glucose is the easiest molecule for your cells to do this. Your cells are pretty lazy when it comes to this and they would prefer glucose over anything else. However, they can do this with amino acids and also fats, but glucose is the easiest. So let's look at some of this. Now, one of the main ones we talk about when we're dealing with the pancreas in the endocrine system is diabetes mellitus. This is commonly known as just diabetes. But when we look at this, guys, this is the most common major disease of the endocrine system. It's the one that most people know about. Now, it affects carbohydrate and sugar utilization uh, by your cells due to the lack of insulin. And so your blood sugars tend to stay high because then your cells don't realize they need to take in that extra glucose in order to utilize that for ATP. So there are some particular symptoms that come along with diabetes mellitus. Um, when we look at these, we see we have polydipsia. This is going to be excessive thirst that the patient will experience. We also see polyuria, which is going to be increased urine output. Now this goes hand in hand. When you are constantly going to the bathroom and losing water, your body wants to replace that and, and feeling thirsty helps with replacing that fluid. This can also then lead to severe dehydration when we look at the fact that you are constantly um, letting the water go through the urinary system. And it also can cause ketoacidosis. Now, ketoacidosis is going to be where there's a decrease in your pH in your blood, which can affect other parts of the functioning of the blood, like carrying oxygen and also just the pH within the tissues themselves. Another thing that we see, though, is it causes also glycosuria, where there's glucose actually that spills out into the urine, which is not something that normally should happen. And we see that it causes hyperglycemia, where, of course, when we took your blood sugars, it will be high. OK, so the blood sugars will be higher than normal. Another thing you see with individuals who have uncontrolled diabetes is the ketones that are being produced in this process of um, the ketoacidosis and um, your body processing and using different forms for energy besides glucose, it causes those ketones to be able to be smelled on the breath and it has kind of a fruity smell to it. Now, there are two main types of diabetes that we're going to talk about here and we have type 1 and type 2. Now, type 1 is previously known as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Um, this one is the most serious type, and it affects children and young adults before the age of 25. So you get diagnosed with type 1 normally before the age of 25. There are some rare cases that diagnosing this comes later. But the problem with this particular type of diabetes is 
that it probably is an autoimmune disorder. Something has happened to those cells that release insulin in your pancreas where they're not doing it anymore. They're not doing it pretty much at all. And this could be a genetic issue or an autoimmune issue. And so because of that, they don't produce insulin and they need to to use insulin injections. And these injections are gonna be given daily. Individuals do not usually secrete the insulin, which makes the blood glucose control very difficult. And so getting the right insulin levels and monitoring this is super important. Individuals with type 1 diabetes have to follow a strict diet in order to keep their sugars a little more under control. They also have to monitor their blood levels on a regular basis. And so they're going to have those little monitors that test their blood for their glucose on a regular basis. They also have to administer their own insulin daily. And exercise and stress can actually alter their insulin needs. So they have to be careful of this. Exercise we talk about is normally a good thing in order to help your body. But when it comes to your insulin levels, it can affect them and cause dosage issues. And so if they're going to exercise, they do need to monitor those sugars very closely. Also, stress can alter them as well. And so exercise routines and stress management have to be part of their treatment plan. Now type 2 diabetes is formerly known as the non-insulin dependent diabetes and it's actually the most common form of diabetes and this develops normally later in life. Okay, it's going to normally occur um, after the age of 40 and if the individual is obese and also being female increases your risk. Um, Now frequently seen in younger obese people though that it's developing, we see a lot of times you might be termed as pre-diabetic early on and so they really will monitor this as well to hopefully prevent you from becoming diabetic in the future. Now, this is thought to be caused by a wearing out of the pancreatic islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. Um, It's usually going to be controlled, though, by diet, exercise, and oral medications. Now, these oral medications will help stimulate insulin secretion. It's not that your pancreas doesn't actually make insulin like we saw in type 1. It's, it's having maybe a hard time or not realizing it needs to be released. And so medications can help with that, but also watching your diet and having good exercise routine helps a lot with type 2 diabetes and its control. Now guys, it's really important that we control the blood sugars if somebody is diabetic because complications can occur very quickly. We see both coma and shock can happen if we have improper insulin administration, especially when we're talking about if with the type one but it can happen even when we're looking at type two. So diabetic coma is going to progress slowly. It is due to a excessive level of glucose in the blood called hyperglycemia. And we do see it the result of not taking enough insulin or eating too much of of those carbohydrates can cause this to occur. So the symptoms of diabetic coma, they are going to be progressing slowly as they come on, but they include polyuria, polydipsia, dehydration, and ketoacidosis like we saw before. However, the symptoms of the coma are going to be where they have a slow, deep breathing pattern, and they have that fruity or sweet smelling breath. That's part of this. Now, a patient can also go into diabetic shock. Now, diabetic shock actually happens very quickly. It's a rapid progression. It is going to be where you overcompensate for the high levels of sugar. And this causes your glucose to drop greatly and it causes hypoglycemia. This is normally when they give themselves too much insulin or if they cut out carbohydrates altogether, it could alter it and be a problem in their diet. Symptoms here is diaphoresis. So we have excessive sweating, lightheadedness, trembling, and a state of confusion. Now this ultimately is followed by a coma, but it just comes on a lot faster. The coma from the insulin shock is a medical emergency. It needs to be addressed right away. Okay, so these are two complications, but they are due to the fact of uncontrolled blood sugars. And we need to make sure that diabetics are watching and monitoring those very closely. Now, another complication could be things like arterial sclerosis, where we have a clogging up of the arteries that can occur. Diabetic retinopathy is another, and this is where the retina and the eye is affected, and it causes blindness to occur. And there could also be kidney damage. Now, guys, these three are the long-term effects of uncontrolled 
diabetes. And so if a patient is working hard to control it and they keep it under control for the most part, these three complications could potentially be avoided or at least slowed way down. The problem is, is that they can be long-term effects of that uncontrolled high blood sugars. Well, how do we diagnose diabetes mellitus? Well, we're going to diagnose it with a history and a physical exam. The history is, guys, if you have a lot of individuals in your family that are diabetic, you have a higher chance. It doesn't mean you will be diabetic, but you do have a higher risk factor. Now, treatment. There is no treatment. Oh, And also with diagnosis, we do see that they do blood glucose testing. Now this testing can be done. This testing can be done in an hour block or they can do the long test, which is longer. And these are things they do also in pregnancy, which we'll talk about in a minute, but they have you drink a a drink that's pretty high in sugar and they take your blood. Okay. Pretty quickly after you drink it and then they monitor it. They take blood every couple of hours or every, or at the end of the hour, if it's an hour test and they see how your body's compensating and handling that excessive amount of sugar that was from that drink. If you're diabetic, that will stay high. There'll be an issue because insulin's not being produced. So blood glucose testing is part of that. Um, They also can just test your blood glucose just with a droplet of blood. All right, now treatment, guys. There's no cure. There's no cure for diabetes. The individual just needs to follow their individualized treatment plans, and this will continue for their whole life. Now, these plans might be adjusted based on, on the fact that you age and your hormones change and lots of things can occur, but this is something that's gonna be a lifelong battle that the patient's going to have to undergo. Now, this does bring us to gestational diabetes. This occurs only during pregnancy. This is a diabetes that comes into play during pregnancy, and then it resolves itself normally after pregnancy. It's usually discovered with the routine urine testing during prenatal visits. They start to see there could be glucose within the urine, and this is going to prompt them to then do further tests. Now, the treatment for gestational diabetes is diet exercise, and then also medications. They may need to take insulin during the time of their pregnancy. Injectable insulin will help control those blood sugar levels a little bit easier than taking oral medication. Now, gestational diabetes usually disappears after delivery. However, in some cases, it may turn into type 2 diabetes. Women often affected um, are going to be Women who often have gestational diabetes during their pregnancies have a higher risk factor of actually developing the adult onset diabetes, which is the type two later in life. Okay. Not right when they have those children, but later in life. One way to help prevent this, well, there's not really, there's no preventative measures, but women who observe a more healthy lifestyle and a normal weight at the time that they conceive, they tend to have a lower chance of developing gestational diabetes. Doesn't mean that they don't get it. They just have a lower risk factor. All right. Now the opposite. These were examples of hyperglycemia when we talk about diabetes. What about hypoglycemia? Hypoglycemia is an abnormally low blood sugar. This is where your blood sugars get lower than 60. Now, this is pretty dangerous because hypoglycemia causes lightheadedness to occur, uh, diaphoresis, and trembling, and it can also cause the individual to pass out. Diagnosis is going to be a blood glucose test and treatment is dependent on the cause. There's lots of different reasons somebody can develop hypoglycemia. It could be due to the fact that they are administering their insulin too much. They are diabetic and they are giving to themselves too much insulin. Some people can have what we call reactive hypoglycemia where their body overreacts when they take in too many sugars and it compensates too greatly. So there's a number of different reasons. And so we need to know what the underlying cause is in order to know the proper course of treatment. All right, this brings us to reproductive gland diseases. Um, When we look at this, guys, these are going to deal mostly with the hormones. We're going to look more specifically at other reproductive diseases in the next chapter. But we do see you can have what we call hypergonadism. This is an increased hormone production that happens before puberty. Okay, and so this a lot of times causes what we call precocious puberty, where it starts earlier than it should. 
The diagnosis of hypergonadism is going to be by a blood test and they're going to look for elevated hormone levels. Now, treatment is going to be most the removal or radiation of a tumor if it's present to suppress the hormones. This could be a tumor that's in the uh, pituitary gland, or it could be a tumor that's found on the actual reproductive organs, but also administration of hormones to suppress or counteract the sex hormones may need to be done as well. Now, I see that there's a little bit of a typo here. The next bullet is talking about hypogonadism. This is going to be where there's a decreased hormone production by the age of puberty. They're not producing enough. Again, diagnosis is going to be by a blood test for those hormone levels. And so we're seeing that they don't start puberty like they should. Treatment here is we're going to administer the proper hormone. They would have, of course, the increased amount of testosterone being given or estrogen depending on their sex. And so because of this, this would allow them to start to develop with the normal puberty secondary sex characteristics, even though their body's not producing those hormones yet. And they may start producing them once this happens. But this might be a lifelong treatment though as well, depending on the underlining cause. All right, let's look at the trauma. Now, trauma can happen with the endocrine system, but normally it's going to be related to a head injury. Head injuries can lead to can lead to multiple organ dysfunction, including the fact of the endocrine system. Because remember, the master gland of the endocrine system is the pituitary gland, and that is located at the base of the hypothalamus in the brain. Now, organ destruction and failure can be life-threatening if the hormones are affecting these things, okay? And so we do see that it could be a life-threatening issue if those hormones get way out of whack and start to cause organ destruction. Now, guys, when we look at endocrine system diseases, they're all rare, Okay, most diseases of the endocrine system are relatively uncommon. You don't see them very often, with the exception, of course, of diabetes and thyroid problems. Those tend to be a lot more common than any of the others. But we do see that they are the ones that we know a little bit more of with treatment options. Okay, but we do see that the exceptions are the thyroid problems and diabetes. All right, effects with aging. When we talk about the aging process, remember it does affect multiple organs through our body. Our tissues start to get tired. Our organs start to get a little worn out and tired due to everything we've done to them over the years. So we do see the same thing with the endocrine system. We see there's a decreased secretion from our glands as we age. So certain hormone levels really start to drop. We also see that we have a lessened glucose tolerance as we get older. And so this is one of the reasons why type 2 diabetes is more common. Digestive and metabolism problems are very common as we age. And remember that your metabolism is controlled by your thyroid hormones, as well as the digestive system with those different glands that release hormones for digestion. And then diabetes mellitus is more common as we age. We see that becoming diabetic is something that is more common as you age due to the fact of not taking care of yourself when you're younger and just not watching those sugar levels, as well as the increase a lot of times with family history. So these are some of the effects of age on the endocrine system. Now, This finishes up the endocrine system diseases and disorders. So if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to ask. Mm